Hello, my name is Sofia Lemos and I'm the Associate Curator of Public Programs at the Rig International Biennial of Contemporary Art and suddenly it all blossoms. Today it is my pleasure welcoming you to the third convergence of our online series of talks and conversations, this week themed love. Today we share the world with feminist thinker, writer and translator Sophie Lewis, who defines her work as utopian and herself as anti-work, anti-racist, queer communist, who understands the nuclear family to be capitalist point zero. For Sophie, family is a biopolitical fiction and kinship is always made, not given. Her first book, Full Surrogacy Now, Feminism Against the Family, which came out last year with Verso Books, gained widespread attention. In it, Lewis discusses how the surrogacy industry may help us consider that all gestation is labor following the footsteps of leading radical feminists before her, such as the Wages for Housework campaign of the International Feminist Collective, who first announced the factory in the family in the 1970s. By imagining feminist futures grounded on family abolition, Sophie reminds us to the extent to which love, our glossary work for this week, has and can cultivate, quote, non edible kinship, and sharing reciprocal mothering labors between many individuals and generations." Unquote. Sophie publishes a work on both scholarly and non-academic platforms, including the Boston Review, Science, Science as Culture, Jacobin, The New Inquiry, and Mute. She's a member of the Out of the Woods Collective and an editor at Blind Field, a journal for cultural inquiry. A student of Marxist geography, she's visiting scholar at the Alice Paul Center of the University of Pennsylvania, as well as a part-time faculty member at the Philadelphia branch of the Brooklyn Institute for Social Research. This evening, Sophia will share a new piece of writing with us, predicated on the worldly contingencies of the nuclear family, the work of death doulas, and the personal journey, journal, pardon, the personal journey of a family abolitionist into the horizon of comradeliness. Writing about how to live and die well with each other during the current pandemic, Sophie will tell us about her mother, who passed away last November with a stage four cancer, requiring her to travel back and forth between her home in Philadelphia and a hospital in the UK, a journey she technically wasn't allowed to make due to the pending status of her green card. Dear Sophie, we look forward to attuning to your reading and for a few questions at the end. Thank you again for sharing your experiences and reflections with us. Mothering against the world. Birthing me at the age of 42 almost killed my mother. A midwife was by her side, however, at the birthing home. And at the critical moment, this doula fetched a doctor who saved both our lives mums and the life of the fetal pre-version of me. This occurred just over three decades ago in Austria and today I live in the United States and I can happily say that I count midwives, birth doulas, death doulas, abortion doulas and finally full spectrum doulas who blend all three among my friends. I even briefly met my lifesaver, my parents' midwife, on a trip to Vienna years ago. The word midwife in English, at its root, mit wif, simply means with woman. To midwife as a verb is to be a woman with, a companion to another, especially during the more slippery, wet moments of social reproduction I have theorized elsewhere as amniotechnics, partum, miscarriage, departure. I kind of like this etymology. It suggests to me a commitment to being with, or as Donna Haraway would say, staying with the trouble, no more, no less. But the more common term nowadays in the Anglophone world, as you probably know, is doula because our collective preference seems to be for the apparent gender neutrality of a word that originally meant slave or servant in ancient Greek. We prefer this over a word that includes that ur-gendered word, wife. But for my purposes, it is enough 
that demonstrably anybody can be a good with wife. And my understanding, such as it is, of what that means is that it involves facilitating the crossing of liminal thresholds and lubricating the beginnings and ends of human life forms. Especially in the United States, the different subfields of the doula vocation are variously undergoing a slow but sure professionalization. Yet doulaing, as every doula I know insists, is not a profession. Rather, it is a sort of open access verb. <laughs> you or I, in other, in other words, singly or as a collective, might at some point or other be called to doula, the inaugural emergence or the terminal shutdown of someone's body. You never know when an extra hand might be required on the occasion of someone's expulsion of a fetus, dead or living, from their uterus. You never know when your simple watchful presence might be called for because someone is dying and because without you there, they would be utterly alone. Mum's death occurred shortly before the age of COVID-19, but it was for different reasons that she got no funeral. It wasn't a lack of money. It wasn't objective logistical impossibility either, although there were seas and oceans dividing her remains from the parties who might have organised one. No, it derived from the difficult fact that mum, who lived alone and seemed to have alienated more or less every friend ever to have entered her life, simply had almost no one. She had no one apart from her damaged and damaging nuclear kin, i.e. me, my brother Ben, and our father, her ex-husband. I defy anyone to tell me that the misery such situations entail this heartbreaking insufficiency amid good intentions, this ideological blackmail born of the very scarcity it itself produces is a viable model for organizing human lives. If I had not been a family abolitionist already, I can assure you I would have become one last autumn. Please hear the complaint I'm making, not merely as self-pity, but as a scream for a world in which good deaths, the arts of witnessing grief and grieving are taught to all children from an early age. I will not gloss over this nor counterbalance it with something hopeful and consolatory. There was not enough doula-ing around mum's death. She had extraordinary hospice workers, yes, but no dedicated companion committed to seeing her over the edge. We had two children, her official kin, had to do our best at putting ourselves to one side in order to perform that function. And there weren't doulas there for us, the death doulas, either, at least not in any kind of sufficient number. Sure enough, looking back at the situation with the benefit of seven months worth of hindsight, it is easy to articulate this criticism about mum's death in the register of the transitional demand. More damn doulas. Certainly the three of us would have needed a doula or several in order to make a public burial or cremation ceremony thinkable. My mother was among many other things, an excellent writer, a gifted humorist, and a German Anglophile in near total exodus from Germanness. She was a white, cisgender, heterosexual, a consummate flirt, thrice divorcee, twice from the same man, and a middle-class liberal who was briefly an organized Maoist 68er at the University of Göttingen. She was a survivor of parental neglect and abuse and the first in her family to go to university. She was a willful, impossible, not explicitly feminist woman who at the age of 40, having achieved perfect bilingualism and a position at the BBC German service, suddenly changed her mind about not having children and married my father, an Englishman 10 years her junior. She then gestated two infants in a row 
first me, then my brother, and raised us to puberty with insufficient help from her new husband as well as insufficient help from a succession of au pair girls, the paid mothers of my childhood. It seems that mum vigorously refused the cultural and social identity mother even at the start before she became suicidal. She shrieked with protestatory laughter, for example, if ever a child referred to her as la maman de Sophie. We lived in France. She disliked it when my brother called her mama. On the other hand, much later, she suddenly did want to be addressed by us grown-up kids, not as Ingrid, but as mom, and above all, mumputz, a characteristic English, Deutsch, i.e. Engloitsch coinage of hers that seems to perfectly sum up her recalcitrant, roundabout, tragicomically belated identification with feminist mothering. In her 2018 novel Motherhood, the Canadian writer Sheila Hetty is critical of the way that some mothers in her culture talk, quote, as though a child is something to have, not something to do. The doing is what seems hard. The having seems marvellous. But one doesn't have a child. One does it, unquote. Hetty here reformulates the tension so powerfully articulated in Adrienne Rich's feminist classic of woman born between reproductive labor's potential to affect liberatory kin making, that's mothering on the one hand, and anti-liberatory privatization, motherhood on the other. She is recalling the dialectic of mothering against motherhood that Rich's intellectual heirs are still thrashing out to this day. The competing truths, mother is an institution and mother is a verb. Part of this dialectic is the negation of mother violence by other mothering, or to avoid appropriating a term, the term other mother from black feminism, and instead to coin another in order to designate people who do mothering without necessarily being mothers, we could speak of the multi-generational motherers of many people's experience, those who do mothering. When I think of mothering, it is not my mother who springs to mind, but rather precisely those other humans in my life who helped reverse and heal the pain that she, among other people, inflicted over the years by not mothering me in any significant way through my adolescence in particular. My mother was many things, but as far as I could see, she was not a motherer. She was actually one of the least care-oriented individuals of my acquaintance. But she was also exactly the kind of person, like me, who would be tickled by a cringe-making coinage like mom raid, while also seeking to take that neologism's little joke entirely seriously, i.e. putting the notions of mothering and comradeliness into earnest dialogue with one another. And that's what I'm trying to do here. I am, after all, a personality and a body somewhat in her likeness, hurt and faithfully disloyal as I am. The residual trauma of mum's desertion remains one of the severely challenging things in my life. Yet besides hurt and hatred, I also feel deep empathy bordering on respect vis-a-vis -vis her disgusted exit via suicidality from the misery of the marriage and nuclear family system. It has been hard for me to condemn her outright for opting out of a job, the job of mothering me, that capitalist society was compelling her to do in such a lonely way. I've already alluded to my book, Full Surrogacy Now. You see, one of my main political commitments at the moment is to the queer revolutionary slogan, abolish the family. Alongside a small but swelling number of avowed 
family abolitionist writers in the US and the UK, as well as in Vienna as it happens, I currently contribute to a theoretic tendency that deems the positive supersession of the nuclear normative family to be, no, always to have been, the proper object of queer critique and communist feminist struggle. It is our contention that under capitalism, families are fundamentally a way of organizing work. For those of us opposed to the tyranny of work, therefore, the crucial question becomes, how can we preserve the labor we do out of love while destroying the labor that capitalism steals from us? As Madeleine Lane McKinley puts it, abolish the family for kids. In Lane McKinley's chapbook of poetry, Dear Z, the poet writes to her child, quote, I wonder how to abolish the family, not without you, but with you, unquote. How would you talk to a child about family abolition? I don't entirely agree with the received wisdom that mothers in the present conjuncture should conceal from their children at all costs that they regret having had children. If you ask me, of all the things that mum puts did wrong, the fact that she did not conceal this was among the least of them. Children, while needful of and entitled to abundant, unconditional commitment, are also clearly capable of reciprocal comradeliness. They, that is to say we as children, frequently desire not to be falsely sheltered from the opportunity to practice empathy and solidarity. Children cannot be well mothered by the unmothered and they are not collectively well served by the bio-legal lottery system that allocates them quasi-irreversibly to the private care of a few adults, to live in the lonely, unsustainable, car-dependent architecture of heteropatriarchal atomization. Kids are, in fact, probably, be probably better than most people at intuitively grasping that the more loving and chosen the family the more amenable it may be to self-abolishing. Family abolition, as Michelle O'Brien defines it, is, quote, not the destruction of kinship ties that currently serve as protection against white supremacy, poverty, and state violence, but instead the expansion of that protection into broader communities of struggle that include, at the heart of their democratic processes, very young people. Kids, in their inspiring freedom from proprietarian ideology, are themselves the inventors, not just the heirs, of the possibility of the future care commune. Duh, nobody should have to be shackled in an apartment to their gestator or gestatee against their will in the template communes envisioned by utopian socialist Charles Fourier in the 1800s or by Shulamith Firestone in 1970, children and parents alike can opt out of a toxic dynamic, safe in the knowledge that no one will be left entirely uncared for. O'Brien distills the central idea like this, no one is bound together violently any longer. As a child, I did not want anyone to be bound together violently. For this reason, I don't think I ever got confused about the difference between a mother's regretting of motherhood and my mother wishing me dead. To understand that having kids, at least having kids in this way, with this man, in this world, was the wrong decision for mum, was not something to take personally or to take offence at. To be clear, I'm not saying I am not resentful angry or deeply in need of healing. It is just that as an anti-work, anti-racist, queer communist who understands the nuclear family to be capitalism's point zero, I cannot wholeheartedly condemn mum's past insistence during that time when she was still trying to mother on being finite. I have always intuitively loved a slut, a slattern, a woman on strike. 
Somewhere along the road, I connected the dots. I recently realised that I have deep respect for important aspects of Mumputz's scant parenting style. Now, counterintuitively, perhaps, I think I came to this appreciation via reading the black feminist philosophy of Alexis Pauline Gums, counterposing black mothering to hegemonic motherhood. Gums, an independent scholar, poet, activist, and educator in North Carolina, historicizes the collective polymaternal labor of black women, those who were never meant to survive, in Audre Lorde's phrase, as queer, quote, because it disrupts the social reproduction of capital by offering an alternative social framework, unquote. M slash other, writes Gums, is a verb, black mothering the production of radical difference when done for ourselves as a reclamation of labor and a reflexive intervention against the reproduction of sameness is an alternate mode of production. In researching full surrogacy now, I'd been deeply curious about exactly this, how the multi-gendered labors of baby making in and against white supremacy might be conceived of by gestators as implicated in a revolutionary politics of commune building. How is mothering, despite being called reproduction, sometimes in fact anti-reproductive because anti-proprietary. In what ways might mothers of all genders abolish not only motherhood qua property ideology, but also existing society as a whole? In what ways might the collective arts of care labor unmake worlds? And here finally were some answers. I've learned that baby making has long been explicitly recognized in some strands of black feminism as a destructive as much as a creative enterprise, an insurgency of the commons and an unnatural danger, personal yet plural, intimate yet inclusive, loving yet unpretty. The motive question undergirding this poetics for the structurally queer mothers or motherers involved seems to be a practical one. How can this world ending, not just world making power, be collectively harnessed, organized and directed? Now, I want to be absolutely clear. The main way this black, queer, anti-capitalist, poly maternalism literature has led me to appreciate my own mother's parenting is of course simply in the negative. Hers, was obviously very much not the subversive bad mothering that is bad for capitalism theorized by Gums. Mum's passive slowdown or white strike was categorically not somehow a production of rival mothering antithetical to the reproduction of the nuclear heteropatriarchal family. As another Alexis, Alexis Shotwell, compellingly reminds white people in the United States context, black mothering cannot simply be taken up by white people and quote, indigenous practices of relationality cannot be taken up by settlers. We must craft new practices of being in relation that can destroy settler colonialism and its articulation with anti-black racism and border militarism. And this project represents my groping towards that painful and difficult task that Shotwell names as claiming bad kin, the needful project of those of us with European heritage, quote, claiming rather than disavowing our connection to white supremacist people and social relations, of friends and comrades working as race traitors against whiteness, unquote. In saying that black polymaternalist feminisms helped me appreciate my committedly white mother, what I'm saying is that they give me words to put to that horizon, one which mum's historic neglect merely drove me to, whereas they open it. As part of a collective practice of family abolitionism, I know I must claim my bad kin. 
So here is my starting point. Mum was no queer motherer, yet in her performance of motherhood there was one kernel of something Alexis Gums names in her analysis of revolutionary mothering. Namely, the reclamation or refusal of imposed labour. The best way I know how to put it is this. Although she was by no means queering motherhood, and although she was white and cis and straight and middle class, Mum Puts did motherhood as though it were a form of drag. I don't know that I have forgiven her everything, but I am grateful to Mum Puts for her structurally queer denaturalization of mother love and her imminent critique of the invisibility of domestic reproductive labour. Her dissatisfaction with the status quo was, I know, transmitted to all her kids, biological and not. In December 2019, I found myself finally, stunningly, bereaved of mum puts. And one day, stumbling out of my home in a fog of incomprehension, I spotted a flyer taped to a lamppost direct, directly outside my building in Philadelphia, hailing me, Grief Circle. The Philly Death Doula Collective, I read, will be facilitating a regular grief circle for those identifying as women, trans, and or non-binary. It will be a safe space for people to share their stories of loss, sorrow, and grief. I have been attending every circle convened by Kai McDonald, the founding death doula of the Philly Death Doula Collective, ever since. There's not much to explain about grief circles per se. They are confidential, loosely anonymous gatherings that are free or sliding scale for the sole purpose of bearing witness to the grief of others and being witnessed in one's own. The core premise is that witnessing grief reciprocally is an ancient form of mutual aid, if not the most ancient. There is no toxic positivity and no advice giving. Ours currently uh, takes place weekly and draws between six and 15 attendees, about three of whom so far have remained constant throughout. Our grief circle stepped into overdrive this spring for obvious reasons. The world is awash in grief. Kai now sh uh, schedules specific circles for so-called essential workers. COVID deaths, especially for the racialized populations that are bearing the brunt of the virus, are rarely good deaths. And Kai's trauma-informed practice holds that lonely, fearful, and disenfranchised deaths in turn breed trauma among the living. Overdose deaths deaths that are part of the pre-existing opioid epidemic have been the majority of the deaths I've heard about in Grief Circle. But there have of course been myriad other species of death, unexpected ones and planned ones, good deaths and bad, experiences of dying well, experiences of dying stubbornly and in denial, shootings, car accidents, suicides, complications from diabetes, cancers, Multiple deaths, one's own imminent death through terminal illness, breakups, dead hopes and dreams, infertility struggles. At Grief Circle, we witness it all. Grief whirls like wind. It does not go away, oftentimes, after the same 20 conversations have been had with patient friends. It tires, it maddens, it frustrates, or equally, it reorients desire, sometimes fruiting in the form of lush anti-productivity. Grief can bring both anhedonia and joy, fog and lucidity, desire and depression to an alienated life. When our grief has structural causes, it can be the ground of struggle and a potent political force. For grief shows us what we love and what we want to fight for. Like death, it can be bad for the economy. The laws of value accumulation would have us rush it. And that's why there is resistance in death doulas' power to insist on time and space for grieving. The clocks of capital tick out or steer rations of compassionate leave for the bereaved. Time to move on, they hiss. 
but in a better society we would have great numbers of the kinds of place for public weeping that Anne Boyer planned to build before she got sick with cancer. Quote, a temple where anyone who needed it could get together to cry in good company and with the proper equipment, unquote. Before the time of coronavirus, our gatherings were hosted in a kind of temple, Kai's living room. Nowadays, the circle, like every other goddamn thing in life, takes place on Zoom. But actually, this works. Our grief is geographically dispersed now. It feels a bit like consciousness raising. Recently, for example, the alternative intimacy of the, mut the muted virtual listening and the sensitivity we've begun to develop to each other's facial cues on gallery view unleashed, unleashed a wave of collective crying I had never experienced before in that forum. All eight of us, as I recall, were crying along with a healthcare provider in Oregon who was unbearably exhausted, overwhelmed by the fear and death that COVID-19 has unleashed in her workplace. And after that, we cried for someone who felt utterly bereft. A life part partner of 50 years was dead and the pandemic lockdown measures are only compounding her hopeless loneliness. At the end of February, having listened plenty during grief circles to my vertigo about society's unwillingness to speak ill of the dead, and my anguish about my mother's lack of a funeral, Kai offered to help me conceptualize a memorial. That's a great idea, I immediately said. Yes, one with cigarettes and vodka in her honor at the nature reserve. So we had a planning discussion and the date I picked was April 25th. So I don't need to tell you that it turned out to be yet another appointment transferred from meet space to Zoom. 30 people ended up participating, including my two friends who helped with mum's transfer from hospital to the hospice and a substantial number of unconnected friends who'd been bereaved of their own parents and were simply hungry for ritual or else willing to bear witness for my sake. And Kai looked on. My heart felt full and serene. Poems were read and songs were sung according to the program I drew up. I'd spent the best part of a week working on a slideshow studded with many gigabytes worth of photos and music, ample quotations from her writing that I'd never read before, video of her in hospital telling jokes, and even an audio clip from her 1970s radio documentary work on German Jewish refugees living in the UK. I sucked in rancid cigarette smoke indoors and I drank vodka during the day and I felt truly that I was in her presence. I exhaled. I admired the incomplete tapestry of her painful, beautiful life I had constructed out of PowerPoint. I returned, insofar as that's possible, the virtual gaze of my laughing, weeping friends. I glimpsed family abolition. I got some respite. I felt proud, and I still do. According to Jodie Dean, a comrade is one of many fighting on the same side. And towards the end of mum's life, inspired by the death doulas of the hospice system, these deeply skillful emotional labourers, at times indistinguishable from sex workers, I arrived, I think, at long last, at a radical acceptance of the way that that line defining sides happens to have been drawn in that life. I accepted her drinking, her pill popping, her smoking. What she wanted was not to talk, make amends or reconcile, but simply cigarettes and wine. And at the end, this wine was dispensed to her via a sponge on a stick. I stopped siding against her. On one occasion, I stroked her forehead very gently and will never forget the realization of how radically my fingertips, any fingertips, were needed in that place. For she closed her eyes instantly, whimpering with pleasure. Perhaps we can say that she was lucky and we were all lucky 
that she departed before COVID-19 took hold in the time when such touch was still possible. In disidentifying with the label mother, my puts in chief ended up, ironically enough, cleaving to that mechanism of conservation, reproduction and quiescence that Adrienne Rich called motherhood. But this, to be sure, is why that old distinction between mother and what I've proposed to call motherer is so crucial. Mothers have, after all, historically both brought down oppressive regimes and built them. On the one hand, maternal feminists, maternalist activists and femonationalists, i.e. so-called mothers of the nation, have served for centuries as prime movers of world systemic evils such as white supremacy, spearheading imperial and settler colonial projects of racial uplift and eugenics. On the other, as we've seen, dispossessed mamas, mammies, other mothers and queer motherers have consistently posed a formidable threat to capitalism and the state. And that dialectic in question is, as black and indigenous feminisms have had to point out, more properly articulated, not as a contradiction in the soul of every mother, but as a structural matter of colonially imposed scarcity, a matter of planetary whiteness and its abolition, a matter of the war between social reproduction from below and class society's reproduction from above, a matter of motherhood's very invention and design, finally, as an institution to render indigenous and formerly enslaved people, kinless. To understand that parenting can be insurrectionary is not to say that whether or not a child turns out well, in the sense turns out a revolutionary, is determined by individual mothers. On the contrary, for better and for worse, it really is a village, not a single author, that manufactures persons. My argument in all my work is for the revival of anti-individual politics grounded in this socio-biological reality that we are the makers of one another and we could collectively learn to act like it. Necessarily to face up to this expansive, watery and mutual network of mothering imperatives that is biological reality is a project that at its core requires us not to retreat into the story of kin, the story of those who are like us versus those who are not like us. The uncomfortable and unpretty fact is that we are all gestating one another, in a sense, wetly and dangerously across species boundaries. And this requires a staying with the trouble of the question of the stranger, the alien, the other, Christina Sharp suggests, speaking to her black audience, that we should lose our kin. But after we have lost them, we need to adopt them and make them anew. It is my hope that after COVID-19, we shall never again demand that people treat one another as family. The vast majority of many types of violence and abuse take place within the family. The far more inspiring political demand is the possibility that we might learn to treat one another as strangers. Feminist philosophy for decades has dismantled the social and cult cultural logics that render the figure of the mother other. I want, however, to make a queer plea for the value of recognising the otherness of a mother suggesting that the task of comradeliness in some instances might require encountering a natural mother in the register of the alien. In her short 2018 treatise, Xenofeminism, Helen Hester sketches out an anti-natural and gender abolitionist politics of reproduction. In particular, in her chapter, Xenofeminist Futurities, Hester elaborates on the xenofeminist proposition that Xenofam is greater than or equal to Biofam. The equation conveys the idea 
that projects of comradeliness vis-a-vis the alien, i.e. so-called non-biological kin-making, or to revive the other half of the ancient phrase, kith and kin, relations of kith, predicated on action and place, that those match or exceed the capabilities of families built on genetic coincidence alone. And the author's careful use of that sign, equal to or greater than, already makes clear to the careful reader that so-called biological procreation can absolutely be a site of comradeliness equal to any other. There is no repudiation of biogenetic reproduction operative here. There is no uh, matrophobia. But Hester even adds the explicit caveat that so-called blood relations can themselves become xenofamilial through an ongoing orientation towards practical solidarity. Xenofamiliality for Hester functions both as a utopian horizon and a latent reality in the present, referring to the ensemble of templates for social reproduction grounded in solidarities synthesized across differences. Mum puts, for me, was not on the face of things. Xenos, a stranger, of course. I knew this woman, obviously, in part because I'd observed and absorbed her intimately throughout infancy, and in part because I actively tried to get to know her as an adult, following a long period of estrangement. But at the same time, she did feel surprisingly alien to me. We felt alien to each other. For one thing, she did not really know me. She didn't really care to know me, although she knew my child self, no doubt. She didn't seek to understand me. She regretted procreativity on the terms of the existing psychoeconomic order. But well, here I was, here I am. We were equally intimate strangers. I'm sorry. We were unequally intimate strangers. We were historically divided companions, asymmetric co-victims and perpetrators of the nuclear family, faced with the tasks, respectively, of dying as well as possible and of instantiating a kind of equality between us. That, in a nutshell, is why the horizon of comradiness, more so than love, in my opinion, seems like the most useful term to think about her need for end-of-life mothering. Comradeliness is not accountability. It does not operate in the register of past history. It names the making history part of the famous Marxist dictum, the present-future-oriented part, not the part about all the weight of unrepaired history that we inherit, the circumstances not of our own choosing. Being a comrade to mum required learning a form of xeno-hospitality, hospitality to the other and the alien, on the basis of equality. We've already mentioned how Donna, Donna Haraway has said, make kin, not babies, but it is less often remarked upon, certainly among straight people, that people who make babies frequently uh, never become kin to those babies. I wish to emphasize then the need to make kin of babies, to make xenofam, as it were, out of one's already existing biofam. Another way of spelling my book title might be as follows, real surrogacy against capitalist feminism and real feminism against capitalist surrogacy, full family now. While the fantasy of blood relationality is that it makes adopting one another unnecessary, in reality, as I sought to argue in full surrogacy now, children never belong to us, their makers, in the first place. The fabric of the social is something we ultimately weave by taking up where gestation left off, encountering one another as the strangers we always are, adopting one another skin to skin, forming loving and abusive attachments and striving, 
hopefully, at comradeship. Kinship, in other words, is always made, not given. By the same token, where kinship is assumed as a given, more often than not, it fails to be made. Could my mothering of my mother, striving to make kith, Zeno hospitably, at the 11th hour, change my mother? Probably not. Could it go some way towards negating her negation of care, though? Could it make a difference? Could it change me? Could it uncover the elements of her mothering that had been comradely and refuse the bad, the uncaring logics of the world that she had, in a sense, mothered in the sense of produced by refusing to mother? It is too early to say. What I can say is that by trying, I forgave Mumputs much. I mothered her, as people say, as best I could, without, however, dropping everything. It both was and was not natural for me to provide this mothering. It was both a reversal of a historic flow of care and an invention of care ex nihilo on the part of someone a little bit motherless for the sake of her mother. It was mothering and anti-mothering, self-mothering and re-mothering of another. It was mothering against my mother's style of motherhood, which was, for its part, both a non-motherhood and, by the same token, an effective mode of reproduction of the present state of things. In the event, my mother was accompanied at the time of her death by no bodily presence other than her ex-husband's, our estranged father, who happened to be visiting. She did have other virtual company too, and I have been telling myself, with some success, that this was real company, good enough. For one thing, she was listening via smartphone to a video recording of my brother and me singing an acoustic guitar version of the oddly sinister pop song Safe and Sound by Taylor Swift. She was watched over too while she died by an also sinister toy lobster from Boston's Logan Airport that I had acquired en route to see her in August 2019 for what turned out to be the penultimate time. Larry the Lobster brought Mumputs a lot of joy and I think made palpable my love for her. She was never henceforth without him. God, he looks evil, she crows, holding him aloft in bed in one clip I filmed on my phone. Doesn't he? Doesn't he? It's true, he does. Although, as she remarked once, depending on the angle you pick, he equally looks deeply sad. As I speak these lines to the Riga Biennial, I'm holding Larry on my lap in my home in Philadelphia, for unlike Mum's ashes, which remain in London, he has already been returned to me. I'm acutely conscious that his crimson polyester fur, his giant glowering plastic eyes, have served this winter as my care surrogate, death dueling the hard carapaced person who gestated my body into existence in 1987 and 1988. It was Larry who bore witness while the tinny sound of mine and my siblings' serenade played on the pillow next to mum's eardrums. Just close your eyes, the sun is going down. You'll be all right, no one can hurt you now. Come morning light, you and I'll be safe and sound. Not a day passes for me when this refrain is not rattling around my head. May it strengthen my collective efforts alongside other multi-species motherers in unvanquishable number to abolish 
the sad and evil world, this present state of things. Thank you. It's, uh, there's already, you know, difficulties within both halves of that because distinguishing production from reproduction in a circuit of value accumulation in capitalism is already hard enough and perhaps not even um, valid. <laughs> so the distinction between the anti-reproductive and the anti-productive already poses, I think, um, some problems. For, um, but I, I, I am interested in chain in pointing out that um, that slippage by by choosing the less uh, accepted, the less conventional term. So um, the 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 manufacturer of a fetus, and by the way, you know, I know some people find that particular terminology somehow offensive already. The the idea of a an industrial language uh, for for a labor that is um, intimate, vital, and um, generative of a, of a new life is is a uh, to some already a problem. Um, I I should say I have no such associations. I have I I understand all uh, labor to 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 be in a sense um you know wet and potentially exciting and uh potentially intimate so it's not i'm not i'm not um it is no it, there is no uh you know slight intended to either industrial manufacture or pregnant people um when when i when i use this kind of definition but the uh the language of uh pregnancy falls under the rubric of reproduction even though uh, newness and otherness arises from it. Obviously, there is production here. <laughs> um, but what is being um, uh, produced and what is being unproduced, potentially, through the mode of doing that labour is, is the intriguing question here. The idea that by... Um, making one another, including making more of one another, literally making a whole other person, might be something that could, um, rather than just replicate history as it is, as though such a thing were possible, but the idea inherent in the concept of reproduction is, is, is a certain kind of uh, fantasy of replication and continuity. Um, the entire idea of genealogy, in a way, uh, can be called into question by you know and has been by marxist biologists well you can you, you don't even have to mention that they're marxists obviously just the fantasy of dna as a kind of um uh, as a sort of insurance of uh, of, of sameness is, is 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 far overstated really uh you know um i mean it is a fantasy um People like Richard Lewontin and, and Levins and Donna Haraway have sort of been been extremely clear on this that the idea of uh, DNA as a sort of uh, self replicate self replicating uh, algorithmic kind of code is is entirely um, you know a, a consolatory myth for 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 a sort of idea of human lineage that 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 predicates um, itself on sort of inheritance and and consolidates sort of groups, classes, families, and so on, where in reality, um, fortunately or unfortunately, there is a great deal more uh, scrambling involved in, in any kind of um, procreative act. Uh, so uh, fortunately and or unfortunately, we, uh, you know, every baby is, is a stranger. Um, uh, and uh, that is the case whether or not, as in you know, literal commercial gestational surrogacy, um, the fetus has no gestational link to the gestator, or, or, or whether it's a sort of natural, normal pregnancy, the, you know, the, the, a, a fetus is always um, simultaneously an organ that is part of your body and a stranger. And that is, that is a very difficult, contradictory, and yet true, you know, um, uh, you know contradiction yeah to get to, to wrap your head around you know so you know contradictory things uh are, are true right <laughs> like how, how can you think of this um uh you know uh, 
sort of productive anti-productivity and this reproductive anti-reproductivity. Um, it, it's 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 a political terrain that I think um, is entirely kind of invisibilized by the dominant ideology of um, you know motherhood as uh, as 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 purely sort of um, uh, uh, sort of almost like palliative and uh, lubricating. Uh, of of that which is rather than that which might emerge, you know. Yes, it's. I think this actually ties into Beanie Adam Shack's concept of uh, seclusion, and so seclusion is, um, in a sense, you know tied to a slightly different field than the one we're talking about here, but it's deeply, you know, germane. Like, so it, it, it's, for, it's, it's primarily for talking about sexuality because to seclude is, is the act of um, uh, fucking from the other perspective. It's the, it's the perspective of the tube or the ring, the, the, the mouth rather than the nipple, um, you know, the, the orifice rather than the shaft. And, it's an intervention that, you know, in many ways had been sort of articulated before without actually having a coinage or a neologism, a proposal to actually speak the activeness of this of this uh, component that, that to, to really actually give us an opportunity to see certain kinds of labor as agentive, as as propositional. So this this pertains to gestation, obviously, because when we think of um, hospitality that we, we, we are in we have insufficient uh, epistemic apparatuses i think we see you know as with films like alien you know um and in a sense also um you know in 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 the biology of human pregnancy there is a sense in which it's 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 a it's a passive um uh, in fact uh you know, defensive experience of invasion and colonization that 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 pregnancy involves, right? That to be hospitable to um, a fetus. I mean, the, my opening line in my book is, "It is a wonder we let fetuses inside us," and um, you know, I, I really mean that. And, and and unfortunately, some people misunderstand me as 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 being horrified by pregnancy. It is absolutely not the case that I am anti-pregnancy. Or, 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 or uh, in my view, negative about pregnancy. Um, I, I, I hope I am sort of much more dialectical than that. It is true that, um, you know, the, 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 the facts, as I, as I think we need to see them, of this brutal, uh, antagonistic, uh, in, sort of entangling um, that takes place between the fetal biology and the gestational biology via this strange interface, the placenta, um, is 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 something that it, you know incurs a lot of risk and a lot of danger. But you know, I am a, I'm someone who is quite amenable to many extreme sports, and I I, I wish people to have adequate support infrastructure, um, you know, and and information to be able to, and particularly distribution if possible, of of risk and labour, you know, to be able to undertake things pleasurably as pleasurably and joyfully as possible. And in order to be able to even have this conversation, we have to understand that, you know, um, a gestator circludes, circludes, you know, is not just passively hospitable in the sense of um, allowing an invasion and suffering a kind of colonization, um, but is actually, you know, laboring. So simple as this might sort of sound that's that insistence really going all the way to the, you know through to the to the logical conclusion of that concept that just you know I, I'm not speaking metaphorically that pregnancy is a hard job because everyone says that everyone already says I really mean that gestation is labor and and so that that speaks to your question a little bit in an you know albeit roundabout way but to be hospitable is not simply to, you know, to, to lie there while someone comes into your house. It is to hold. It is to hold. And our inability to see the, the agentive activeness of holding 
is I think <laughs> one of the one of the sort of endemic features of of um of capitalist patriarchy you know this is in fact a very old radical feminist sort of point uh and yet you know there remains a lot more to be done to flesh out our understanding of of its uh you know of, of, of its uh toxicity <laughs> I mean, the meaning of um, full surrogacy now is also uh, at least twofold. It is a utopian call for a positive actualization of a sort of equal, comradely way of making one another and acting like it. But it is also a dystopian assessment of reality. It is the idea that the concept of the family has always been a bit of a lie that there has i mean of the natural nuclear family that is in a sense self-replicating almost like value itself in capital's understanding of itself the the family has always been sustained by you know chains of care labor that go out almost infinitely and specifically by racialized, feminized uh, labors that are, as Kathy Weeks puts it, um, excised from the family photo. So, you know, to say full surrogacy now is that already now and since the dawning, the invention of this family, this house uh, that is kind of autonomous, as though an organism could ever be autonomous. Lynn Margulis, the biologist, tells us that there can be no such thing. But um, there have always been cleaners, wet nurses, neighbors. I mean, you know, it, th this is also about the, the bourgeois and white disciplinary image of that family, even um, so that, you know, Michelle O'Brien is someone who does wonderful history um, granular historical excavations of the rise of the male breadwinner family by the the white labor movement as as a very you know and, and it's not to be sort of dismissive of this it was huge for the labor movement to claim in a sense um access to this uh to to this mode of reproduction although there were always these massive exclusions and the in a sense that the family capital f has been invented uh, on the back of racialized and black others, which is why, you know, the radical black tradition and black kind of queer feminism in particular has always been sort of saying this. A name you didn't mention is Hortense Spillers, but of course Spillers is central to uh, Hartman and Sharp and Gums um, in, in the sense that um, Spillers identified this kinlessness without necessarily naming it as such, um, in, in the very uh, grammar, right? She called it grammar of American life for the, for the, the, the black woman is not uh, a woman uh, and the black mother is not a mother. Um, and, and this, so the, 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 the black relation to kinship is always kind of uh, outside um, and, and the, the black family is, to be polemical about it, a sort of contradiction in terms. So black families are always in a sense against the state <laughs> or in a sense insurgent. Um, in a, um, so, so black feminism is, is about the, the mothering uh, that, that is not supposed to happen and yet is happening to flourish, uh, to foster sur thrivance as some people are now calling it, sort of, you know, survival pending revolution. Um, and of course, you know, the idea of, uh, of um, you know, uh, private two-person parenting uh, is, is, is something that has always been challenged or not even taken as a given. Not, it doesn't need to be challenged if it in fact <laughs> hasn't been a precept to begin with. For many decolonial and indigenous feminist thinkers as well, Kim Tolbert is someone who speaks very much about how the imposition of a notion of, um, um, you know, a private proprietary parentage 
as well as you know romantic and uh, partnership ties was something that uh, in the in the settler context in Canada and the U.S. was was just imposed by colonizers on populations who did family or kithship or kinship. I mean, these terms are unfortunately very slippery. You know, I, I have, as you can see, no hugely, you know, um, you know, committed. I, I, I'm not, I'm not averse to saying kinship. I, I, I note that there is this other term, kith, that kind of means the same thing, but predicated on place and action. Uh, but in a sense, you know, kinship is a is a bit of a fiction anyway. So it's just equally as made as kith. <laughs> you know, it's just about remembering that. The only thing I think I can really say is that the attempt to impose antenatal, which is always in a sense also a, a pronatal, there's always another side of the coin, like some people must make babies because of this crisis <laughs> um, uh, and other people must not. Um, the tie between those um, logics and xenophobia, so you know there can be no family abolition without um, you know, not 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 open borders, but but no borders, right? We we can't. Um, this is unfortunately the you know, the pessimistic sort of Marxist communization theory kind of uh, conclusion that unfortunately I I inhabit when I when I when I research this this kind of um, theoretic domain. Um, I, I I cannot um, un strategically prescribe a kind of you know, priority of one issue or, or the other. The the abolition of the family can only take place in the context of a an abolition of nationhood, of borders, and of private property itself. Um, which is not to say that I um, have no um, interest or faith. In fact, quite the opposite. In um, you know, movements from below uh, seeking to sort of. Um, uh, contest uh, the, the 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 fascist and fascisant um, sort of uh, attempts uh, in this moment of eco apocalypse to sort of shore up not you know all of those all of those interconnected things the nation um, the sanctity of the 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 biogenetic nuclear heteropatriarchal family you know and 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 the border war. Um, uh, you know, through, for instance, making protest kitchens, experiencing uh, social reproduction that is collective and uh, decommodified in even if only in part, um, and to, to sort of um, uh, use experiences of, of collective excess like that as a sort of springboard for, for really, you know, uh, manifesting and actualizing and growing and expanding something like, you know, the gestational commune. Um, uh, yes, I mean there is the you know the, the relation to the uh, fetal stranger and the relation to the um, migrant stranger is something I would like to 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 emphasize um, and to explore more in in perhaps writings um, in the imminent future as we um, walk together uh, further into this uh, world of. Um, you know, eco-apocalyptic, um, reactionary sort of, uh, uh, revanchism. I'm very, um, inspired by the parts of our utopian movement history that have to do with the the dead, the, the the fact that we fight not just as the, um, you know, typical template for politics has it, the child who is, you know, offensively made into an avatar of the future, whereas in fact children exist in the present and are people already who have desires and entitlements in the now, just like us. But the, 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 the dead are also people for whom we should fight and this was, I, I'm sure, something that came out, I haven't heard it, but C.A. Conrad's talk, um, uh, I understand it touched on the, the, um, the ACT UP and the AIDS liberation struggles. Um, the, you know, 
for certain you know populations and classes the fact that one is not supposed to survive you know is is a is a structural uh, felt fact um and and those of us who 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 die while trying to fight for a world worth living in remain present um you know in in the, in the hearts and in the grief and you know in the struggles of those of us who who continue and in the states when i moved here in 2011 um one of the first experiences i i i remember really um waking me up was the you know the the neighborhood's response to the death of kimani gray where i was living at the time you know i i it really uh uh, and I mean, this was quite late in in my life, but it was uh, it was I, I realized the extent to which um, insurgency in in American cities has so constitutively been, you know, over the the corpses of black children and black men lying on the the street in the aftermath of police violence and 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 lynching essentially state lynching and that the 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 riots and the grieving and the mourning and the organizing sort of flows you know out of that out of that experience out 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 of that loss uh, as a form of love and you know the 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 radical tradition uh, has a has a sort of couplet love and rage you know, being being um, two sides, you know, of the same sword. Um, I I think that line I have uh, just just delivered. I, I think Adrienne Marie Brown uh, formulated something like this: that when the the causes of our collective grief are structural, um, they provide it it that grief then provides a real um, you know source and reservoir of, of uh, transformative potential um, and and something as simple as a grief circle I mean I'm not trying to propose that it is uh, in itself insurrectionary but the that there is something deeply transformative um, at the level of the neighborhood when people get together and and recognize that um, there is just grief 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 and more grief uh, in 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 our lives that is not being made room for um, in in the sort of life required of us in a wage society and in a nuclear family society where there is a sort of paucity of relationships that that that, that really are um, you know committed to responsibility um, and and a, and an excess of work and therefore a paucity of time because trauma is kind of boring it really needs a lot of time <laughs> and it, it, as I was trying to suggest you know um, there is a, a deep you know um, I think uh, depression on the left about the extent to which there is no left but I think experiences like COVID and I'm not saying this is necessarily the case but when we are forced to do a little bit less ex through external reasons, I have a certain kind of hopefulness, a hope against hope, because I, I don't really like the hope framework and I, I hope that we in fact could uh, get to something better than a framework of hope. That's why my uh, ecological writing collective, Out of the Woods, has a book coming out called Hope Against Hope. But um. You know, my hope is that the experience of, of doing nothing and having time to grieve um, might in fact allow slowly, because some things are slow and need time, for a certain kind of appetite and energy and and desire, you know, to, 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 to organize together, to emerge. Because it is not, I think, surprising that in a in a in a world so crushed and rushed uh, by, by work and so starved of opportunities to deeply rest and deeply grieve that, that we do not have a, a superbly, you know, militantly organized immediate mass response. 
Um, and but that doesn't. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I'm 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 cautiously not so worried as some on the left that 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 there is just no desire for utopia. I think there is, and we need a little bit of a rest before we begin to build it. And unfortunately, a lot of us under COVID are having no such experience of rest. And, and that, that goes without saying, and I don't mean to be understood as, you know, proposing that everyone is having a great time. It's deeply not the case. Um, and, and yet there is a little bit of a pause um, for, for perhaps enough of us that something um, interesting might emerge. I certainly think that the pandemic is making it, um, you know, painfully obvious that the nuclear family is not an infrastructure um, up to the task uh, uh, of looking after people under conditions of lockdown and bodily precarity and vulnerability and, and need, you know? So that's kind of exciting in itself. People can really see that, that, that you need a lot more uh, than the family in order to make it through. You know, people are people are sharing things, people are checking in on each other, people are delivering medicines and they are enacting a tenderness towards each other through the mechanisms of masking and distancing.